Hey there, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. I am so happy to have you here. I would just love to get to know you if you are returning. Um, thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. We got sunshine streaming in through the window back here. It's a lovely morning. Grab yourself a drink if you would like, a cozy blanket, your Bible, and let's study John chapter 2. I am really excited for this. We're just going to dive right in. I'm going to take this verse by verse, um, and we're just going to kind of break it down and go deeper with it. John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. The third day was most likely meant like it was most likely day three of Jesus being in Galilee. Some commentaries say since Joseph isn't mentioned but Mary is would suggest that Joseph had died but we don't know for sure. Um, yeah, I found that interesting. Like that he may have already passed away at this point. Verse 2, And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. This is the first of many stories suggesting that Jesus was always welcome among those having a good time. In the Jewish culture of that day, a wedding was the best party of all. Jewish culture of that day, oh, sorry, Spurgeon says, the invitation of Jesus to this wedding says something about the presence of Jesus at weddings. Jesus comes to a marriage and gives his blessing there that we may know that our family life is under his care. His first miracle that he did was at a wedding. Um, yeah, that's like if you were married, knowing that Jesus, yeah, he is, he wants to be in the midst of our marriage. And when he is in the midst of our marriage, that is when our marriage will truly thrive. Um, and also the fact that he, sometimes it can, for myself, I can find myself with like, just, I have such a, a hunger for God and like his word that I just, that's all I want to do is just be sitting, reading his word, being in prayer and just like seeing this, like Jesus was he was always willing to have a good time um and we can do that as well and like still have the presence of him with us where wherever we are and be a light in that way verse three when the wine was gone jesus mother said to him they have no more wine Weddings in Jesus' day were week-long festivals. Banquets would be prepared for many guests, and the week would be spent celebrating the new life of the married couple. Often the whole town was invited and everybody would come. It was considered an insult to refuse an invitation to a wedding. To accommodate many people, careful planning was needed. To run out of wine was more than embarrassing. It broke the strong, unwritten laws of hospitality. Jesus was about to respond to a heartfelt need. It's interesting, and I don't know, like, it's it's hard to know why Mary went to Jesus about the problem of having no more wine. Like, was it just because he was her son, or was she believing that he would work a miracle because she also knew that he was the Messiah, but he hadn't stepped into public ministry yet, um, so maybe she was encouraging him to step into that. Um, yeah, we don't know for sure. Verse 4, Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. Why did Jesus call Mary woman instead of mother? Jesus spoke to his mother with a term of respect, but he did not call her mother. Jesus wanted to emphasize that now, at the beginning of his public ministry, he now had a different relationship with Mary. Why did Jesus say, My hour has not yet come? 
but then goes and does the miracle anyway. Maybe he wanted to pray about it first, then knew what to do because in later chapters in John, it's mentioned multiple times that Jesus said he can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. The recorded words of Mary are few. However, it is good to pay attention to her words that were recorded because they consistently glorify Jesus, not Mary herself. It is wise for everyone to obey, to obey Mary's direction. Do whatever he tells you. Her words show she didn't know what Jesus was going to do about the situation, but she completely trusted him. We should do the same. Verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. The six stone water jars were normally used for ceremonial washing. When full, the pots would hold 20 to 30 gallons. According to the Jews, ceremonial law people became symbolically unclean by touching objects of everyday life. Before eating, the Jews would pour water over their hands to cleanse, them, cleanse themselves of any bad influence, influences associated with what they had touched. It's interesting that how they had to, like the Jews, like it was considered unclean just by touching objects of everyday life. So if I go touch this or touch a pen or like I would need to go wash my hands every time before um, before I would eat. Verse 7. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water so they filled them to the brim. The servants were especially blessed because they obeyed without question and to the fullest. This means that the miracle would be fulfilled in the greatest measure possible. If they were lazy and only filled the jars half full, then would have, there would have only been half as much wine. Spurgeon says, this is the pattern for our faith and obedience. When you are bidden to believe in him, believe in him up to the brim. When you are told to love him, love him up to the brim. When you are commanded to serve him, serve him up to the brim. Verse 8, then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. This took faith on behalf of the servants. I imagine how angry the master imagine how angry the master of the feast would be if they brought him water to taste. Yet in faith they obeyed the word of Jesus. They didn't the servants it doesn't say that they questioned him. It doesn't say like yeah, just I tried to like just trying to put myself in their shoes and knowing like if this is not wine and the master tastes it, like how mad he was going to be at them. Yeah, it took a lot of faith on their part to just step out and do it without questioning. Verse 9, And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside. The master of the feast only knew it was good wine. He didn't know it was a miracle. This knowledge was a special blessing for the servants. This is interesting. Like the servants stepped out in faith. They stepped out in obedience. And because they did that, they got to know or they got to experience the special blessing of knowing it was a miracle when the master and most likely the other people at the wedding didn't know that it was a miracle. So this was something that they got to experience for themselves because they stepped out in obedience. And if we step out in obedience and faith, then we can, then God will have those special blessings for us too that we would not get to experience other, like most likely we wouldn't get to experience them otherwise unless we do step out in obedience and faith. Verse 10, and said, everyone bring, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. 
The master of the feast paid the bridegroom great and public compliment. You have kept the good wine till now. There is a principle behind these words, the principle that for people of God, the best is always yet to come. Verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This beginning of signs in the Gospel of John, the first of seven, is a miracle of conversion from the old ways of the law, ceremony and purification to the new life of Jesus, through which he revealed his glory. John hints at the idea that Jesus showed his glory on the third day and that his disciples believed in him when they saw his glory. They believed in him before, but their belief was deepened and re-expressed. This is typical in the Christian life. God does great things in our lives and we, and we believe in him all over again. Verse 12. After this, he went up to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. Capernaum, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, became Jesus' home base during his ministry in Galilee. Located on a major trade route, it was an important city in the region with a Roman garrison and a, an accustomed station. At Capernaum, Matthew was called to be a disciple, Matthew 9.9. 9. The city was also the home of several other disciples, Matthew 4 verses 13 through 19, and a high-ranking government official for chapter 4, verse 46. It had at least one major synagogue. Although Jesus made this city his base of operations in Galilee, he condemned it for the people's unbelief, Matthew eleven twenty-three, 23, and Luke 10, 15. Now we are going into verse 13, which is where Jesus is clearing the temple. Verse 13, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. The Passover celebration took place nearly yearly at the temple in Jerusalem. Every Jewish male was expected to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem during this time, Deuteronomy 16:16. 16, 16. This was a week long festival. The Passover was one day and the festival of unleavened bread lasted the rest of the week. The entire week commemorated the freeing of the Jews from sla slavery in Egypt, Exodus 12, verses 1 through 13. Jerusalem was both the religious and the political seat of Palestine, and the place where the Messiah was expected to arrive. The temple was located there, and many Jewish families from all over the world would travel to Jerusalem during the key feast. The temple was on an imposing site, a hill overlooking the city. Solomon had built the first temple on this same site almost a thousand years earlier, 959 BC, but his temple had been destroyed by, by the Babylonians, 2 Kings 25. The temple was rebuilt in 515 BC, and Herod the Great had enlarged and remodeled it. Chapter 14 in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchange, exchanging money. The temple area was always crowded during Passover with thousands of out-of-town visitors. The religious leaders crowded it even further by allowing money changers and merchants to set up booths in the court of the Gentiles. They rationalized this practice as a convenience for the worshippers and as a way to make money for a temple upkeep. But the religious leaders did not seem to care that the court of the Gentiles was so full of merchants that foreigners found it difficult to worship. And worship was the main purpose for visiting the temple. No wonder Jesus was angry. The temple tax had to be paid in local currency, so foreigners had to take had to have their money changed. The money but the money changers often charged exorbitant exchange rates. The people also were required to make sacrifices for sins. Because of the long journey, many could not bring their own animals. Some who brought animals had them rejected for imperfections. So animal merchants conducted a flourishing business in the temple courtyard. The price of sacri sacrificial animals was much higher in the temple area than elsewhere. 
Jesus was angry at the dishonest, greedy practices of the money changers and merchants, and he particularly disliked their presence on the temple grounds. They were making a mockery of God's house of worship. John records this first clearing or cleansing of the temple. A second clearing occurred at the end of Jesus' ministry about three years later, and that event is recorded in Matthew 21, verses 12 through 17, Mark 11, 12 through 19, and Luke 19, 45 through 48. Verse 15. So he made a ship out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. God's temple was being misused by people who had turned it to, into a marketplace. They had forgotten or didn't care that God's house is a place of worship, not a place for making a profit or attitude. Our attitude toward the church is wrong if we see it as a place for personal contacts or business advantage. Make sure you attend church to worship God. Verse 16. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Jesus was obviously angry at the merchants who exploited those who had come to God's house to worship. There is a difference between uncontrolled rage and righteous indignation. Yet both are called anger. We must be very careful how we use the powerful emotion of anger. It is right to be angry about injustice and sin. It is wrong to be angry angry over trivial, trivial personal offenses. Jesus made a whip and chased out the money changers. Does his example permit us to use violence against wrongdoers? Certain authority is granted to some, but not to all. For example, the authority to use weapons and restrain people is granted to police officers, but not to the general public. The authority to imprison people is granted to judges, but not to individual citizens. Jesus had God's authority, something we cannot have. While we want to live like Christ, we should never try to claim his authority where it has not been given to us. Verse 17, his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The disciples remembered that line from Psalm 69, verse nine, and connected it to the zeal Jesus had for the purity of God's house in worship practice there. I looked up the word zeal. It means having a great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an object. Jesus had great energy and enthusiasm for the temple of God. And it was a righteous anger um, because unholy things were being done in the temple. Verse 18, the Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Anyone who drove the merchants out from the temple courts claimed the authority to do it. The Jews wanted to know if Jesus really had this authority. The problem is they demanded a sign from Jesus to prove it. Their request for a sign was misguided. What sign could have been more eloquent than that which they had just witnessed? Verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus spoke here of the temple of his body. The irony is that the religious leaders themselves would be the means by which the prophecy was fulfilled. Jesus wasn't against the temple building, but he certainly looked beyond it. He told the Samaritan woman that there was a day coming when people would no longer worship at a temple in Samaria or Jerusalem, but they would worship God in spirit and in truth. And that is, I believe that is why, like, our bodies are now called the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because it, the Holy Spirit within us replaces, like, the actual temple building. Verse 20. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? The Jews understood Jesus to mean the temple out of which he had just driven the merchants and money changers. This was the temple Zerubbabel had built over, I don't know if I pronounced that right, had built over 500 years earlier, but Herod the Great had begun remodeling it, making it much larger and far more beautiful. It had been 46 years since this remodeling had started, 20 BC, and it still wasn't completely finished. They understood Jesus' words to mean that this imposing building could be torn down 
and rebuilt in three days, and they were startled. Verse 21, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. Jesus was speaking of his own body, not the temple building. After, verse 22, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. It was only after the death and resurrection of Jesus that his disciples understood and believed both the scriptures and the specific promises of Jesus. The scripture they believed was primar primarily Psalm 16, verse 10, the promise that God's Holy One would not remain in the grave. Verse 23, now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. I'm also going to read verse 24, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all the people. Jesus knew that this was thin, superficial belief. It wasn't based on anything other than an admiration of the spectacular. Knowing the G this, Jesus didn't commit himself to them. Is our belief in Jesus surface level? Is it based on admiration? Or is it based on faith? and seeking a personal relationship with our Creator. Verse 25, he did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Knowing what was and is in humanity, Jesus still loves. He knew and knows the worst, yet also sees the image of God, even upon fallen men and women. And that concludes our study of John chapter two like we did for John chapter one. Um, if you, by the way, did not watch that, I encourage you to go back um, and watch that. It is on my ch YouTube channel. Um, but let's ask ourselves, how can we apply this chapter to our lives? Because if we, we can study, we can have all the knowledge of scripture that we want to, but if it's not applied to our lives, it will do us no good. And the Bible says, do not be only hearers of the word, but also doers. Number one that I took from it is have faith in Jesus to take care of things the way Mary did. She didn't know how he was going to take care of this, the problem at the wedding of not having any more wine, but she trusted him knowing that whatever he decided to do would be the right thing. Number two, obey Jesus without asking questions like their servants did. When when we feel convicted by the Holy Spirit to do something, stepping out in faith and doing it, even if we cannot see the whole picture. Number three, have a zeal to do what's right the way Jesus had a zeal for the temple. Do we have a passion, a zeal to do what's right and to put away all wrongdoing? Those are the three that I took away from it. I would love to hear what you got out of this chapter, what you learned in this chapter. Um, if, it, if you learned some different things that I didn't mention, I would love to hear it in the comments. Um, and I would also love to hear how are you going to apply this chapter to your life. Thank you for watching and we'll see you for John chapter 3.